Okay, so I just got finished watching Platinum End, and if you didn't know, Platinum End is done by the same author as Death Note, Sugami Oba, and is illustrated by Takashi Obato, and it ran as a shonen from 2015 to January of 21. So in October of 2021, it was turned into an anime, and it ran until March of 2022, where it finally finished. So Platinum End does end, and the beauty of it is, and something I'm gonna give this credit for because this is kind of lost nowadays, it has a beginning, middle, and end. And while it's certainly possible that this happened because it wasn't as well received as some of his other works, I still wanna give it credit because, you know, there was a starting and there's a finish. It wasn't just drug on due to its popularity. All right, so now a quick synopsis for those who haven't seen it and are still here. You guys are masochists, but okay. All right, so you're God and you need to stay immortal. And there's a caveat. And that caveat is you have to absorb some kind of human soul and transmute it and do some kind of alchemaic shenanigans to live forever. And so that's Platinum End. All right, so we start out with Mirai, who is a high school student because Shonen. Okay, so Mirai is suicidal and he ideates this by trying to jump off a building where Nase, his guardian angel, or an angel, let's just say, saves his life and grants him wings and arrows. So obviously wings and arrows here do completely different things. There's the white arrow that can kill and there's a red arrow that can make people do whatever it is that you want with a bunch of caveats. So I wasn't a huge fan of the arrow system and the wing system, but it does create a system or a world building mechanism that does allow for a hierarchy within the angels. That is angels moving up and down in class, you know, video game S, S tier, etc. But also it does relieve some of the pressure for the incongruencies of, you know, a very seasoned, uh, well-adapted warrior and then a middle school student having to face off and fight off, you know? Basically, the arrows and wings followed by the angel advisors kind of level the playing field and kind of help these god candidates have a more fair fight. So all the god candidates are suicide victims. And more than that, as a point of kind of plot complacency or plot convenience, they're all from Japan. And so the anime itself says they're all from Japan because Japan has one of the highest suicide rates. So all through the 90s, the suicide rate for Japan was incredibly high. But if you take a look at this graph here from Our World and Data, you can see that it trends down. In fact, if you look at other sources, you can see that we have to scroll and it's not even a part of the top 10 anymore. So again, plot convenience, but all to say that Japan is doing much better in terms of suicide. In fact, the U.S. has surpassed Japan entirely and obviously South Korea, one of the worst when it comes to suicide rates. Okay, so I just kind of checked the ratings across the board from Japan and America, Rotten Tomatoes, IDBM, etc. Just to kind of give a sense of how well this was received. And for the most part, people didn't really like it. It definitely didn't do as well as his previous work, Death Note. That said, I want to be really clear because these are all going to be theories and just kind of my opinion. If you liked it, you didn't like it, that's fine. Don't like it. Uh, I thought it was just fine. I do think it was kind of average. I can actually put it a cut above this uh, just for kind of the philosophical undertones and the existentialism that they talk and work through. I mean, I give her credit for that. I definitely think it's going to be a steep hill to climb, especially when you're trying to introduce existential philosophy to the mainstream. More than that, to the kind of shonen demographic, which we know skews very young. One thing I want to be really clear about is there's no actual granular research that you can actually do outside of talking to the author, which is kind of a recluse. And, you know, for what it's worth, he probably doesn't want you to really know. And he probably wants it to live out there in kind of this harmony of you thinking about it over and over again. Anyways, my point is these are all opinions and everybody has an opinion, even Reddit. And I did check Reddit afterwards after formulating my own opinion. But just to be clear, all my opinions, especially with all these videos and all these kind of theories, are mine. I don't look for other sources in the beginning. And the reason why is because I feel like I'll be corrupted. As embarrassing as some of my opinions may be, or as wrong or incorrect as they can be, because I've missed material, missed data points, missed plot points, that's fine. But this is my interpretation of it. And so I want to talk about my interpretation of specifically the ending. But again, we kind of have to talk about some of it to get there. Okay, so let's start with episode one. Mirai tries to kill himself, but kind of finds out that, you know, his aunt and uncle are scumbags and kills them accidentally. Anyways, the point of the first episode is really to just engage you and get you to think about this world and get you really, really interested. And I think it works. And I do like how Nase doesn't really care about any of this. It's just very pragmatic for her. It's either ones or zeros. So I, I guess in terms of her programming, it's pretty uh, straightforward. That said, Mirai decides that he needs to introduce the Batman no-kill rule. And so from this day forward, 
He becomes the, I guess, ideal candidate. And I guess this is the author's way of making us really want to align ourselves with him to be rooting for him, I guess. This kind of just doesn't work for me. And I know based on the comments that I've read in Crunchyroll and Reddit, it doesn't work for a lot of people. I do think actually the character development is kind of weak across the board. And actually one of the main characters, Hajime, who dies, even though I didn't like him at first, actually becomes pretty reasonably well-written character, pretty reasonable motivations and kind of an interesting character, even though it's a character that, you know, you would love to hate. All right, so let's fast forward to Metropolitan Man. So Metropolitan Man is the overpowered kid that has everything going for him. Easy villain, easy to hate, easy motivations. Makes sense to me. Um, and then he calls out all the other God candidates. This is like, I don't know, a nod to Death Note. It's like, this guy has just one look, right? Like this author is like, look, I'm gonna call people out. I did it in this series, it worked. I'm gonna do it in this series, it still should work. Question mark? Uh, I don't know. It's fine, I guess, to get the point across. And obviously, again, really, really situational here, but everything happens in Japan, just like in Death Note. And it's just really kind of convenient. So of the characters, one of the characters that I think took way too long to develop is Saki. I just, wow. I She ends up being a pretty decent character and reasonably written, but in the beginning, good God took me forever to get on her side and maybe that was the point of that but I just think it took a little bit too long I think the scene where they're in bed talking through kind of the exposition and why she wanted to kill herself and why she did the things that she did I think that was really an important and touching moment I think the point I want to make here is they almost lost me I literally almost stopped watching the anime here because it took us so long to like care about somebody else and obviously where I wasn't holding down the fort at all. All right, so here's where my kind of take gets probably a little ridiculous. I'm going to go out and limb here and say that everything between now, all the fight scenes, everything, especially Metropola Man and everything like that, is all filler until we meet Yonata. So that said, I think that Yonata here is kind of the key linchpin in terms of understanding the ending. I think he subtly remarks what he thinks in terms of theories, in terms of what could possibly be for humanity, the immortality of it all, and kind of the impositional nature of where we are at in space and time and how we can kind of, you know, travel or traverse through all that and that will happen 500 years from now, etc. That said, if that happens 500 years from now and then that can happen, then it is in fact already happening right now, if that makes any sense. So. Suffice it to say, if he's saying that these predictions come true, then it's happening. And then, you know, what does that mean? That just means that humans have already transcended and become God. So this creature should be us some way, somehow. And that's maybe why it needs somebody to take over and alchemize within to its soul and get absorbed. So here's my theory, and it's pretty basic. It's like Occam's razor. And if you don't know what Occam's razor is, it's whenever you have a bunch of complicated shit the most reasonable and the most likely is usually the answer to the question. Okay, so quickly backtracking to Yonata, just remember that there was a bunch of clues left for us, some breadcrumbs, if you will. And I think the author is suggesting that, you know, when it comes to scientific principles and kind of the nature of science, that in this case, science is immutable, meaning that it's unquestionable because we do know that based on his kind of academic work and his body of work that he's been almost right all the time. So if he is indeed right all the time, then his theory about us transcending 500 years from now has come to pass again. And right now is the same as before. So essentially you're looking at a mirror into our past. And so it's either our past or this is a simulation. But again, I'm using Occam's razor. So using Occam's razor and those principles, I'm just gonna say it's our past just for the sake of convenience. Even if you want it to be a simulation, you can use that theory and you can just kind of transplant what I'm saying. It doesn't matter. Even the simulation works the same regardless if you think it's a simulation or our past. That said, what I think is, you know, we want to die. More specifically, the creature that is us in the future, i.e. God, wants to die. And so if you're immortal and want to die but can't die, then really, truly, the only way forward is to find somebody who wants to die. And the theory is here that God needs to find somebody who wants to die because in order to want to do something, he has to have that in him, that nature within him. So right now, currently, whoever he's absorbed with doesn't have the nature for suicide. More so, he has the nature for benevolence. 
Basically, you need that critical flaw in humanity that allows us to kill ourselves. Because if you're immortal and you're not able to die and you're infallible in those kind of ways and you're essentially a god, then you're not going to kill yourself. But And so the kind of loophole here and the Trojan horse in this case is basically putting that humanness into God. Add to that, you go back into the past and you find a kind of version of humanity where we haven't yet kind of designed ourselves in a way to become perfect. And I think this is kind of telling too, because essentially, you know, if you talk about Yonada and the doctor himself, it's kind of like the seed that creates the immortality. So maybe going back in time, back to this time where essentially 500 years before this immortality becomes really essential, becomes the kind of, again, the linchpin or the beginning or the spark that creates the immortality. So even so, you know, being in a place in a time where it's possible to be fallible. So all that being said, Shuji is really the ideal candidate. And we see that since the beginning, he wants people to die. He lets people die. He has the willingness and the benevolence to allow that to happen as a kind of pseudo God himself. So for me, the ability or the superpower that the God creature was looking for in Shuji that he didn't have yet was the ability to empathize, to have that compassion for suffering. Essentially being able to look at suffering so deeply and so darkly that death and nothingness is not worse than the suffering one can have in the life that you live. Obviously, this is a nod against Buddhism where life is suffering and we do know Buddhism is very prevalent in Japan and also a nod to science. And I think that's why science and the Yanada character are so important. Anyways, that's really all I got and that's kind of my take on this. but. The one thing that I will say is, again, I think a lot of this is just filler. What I'm trying to say is, I think this could have just been a movie, or if anything, do 12 episodes, get rid of Metropolitan Man and all this other kind of noise, if you will. I think the key characters here, Nanato, Mirai, Saki, Yanada for sure. Point is, I think that the problem people have with this is, you know, the actual anime itself overstays its welcome because it's setting up stuff that doesn't matter. And in the end, because it doesn't matter to the end of the story, we should have spent more time with it. It just slams to a halt and it feels really, really abrupt. And and I don't know if that was the intention of the author. If so, it's a high level play and it's definitely a risky gamble in terms of being a good storyteller and wanting to tell a good story. If this is subverting expectations, then I understand that, but I can't imagine that's exactly what he was trying to do. That said, overall, I did enjoy it and I do like it when people try to think about and talk about these kind of high-end, highly complex themes. Very mature themes, if you will. And so here I am making a video so everybody can comment and I really want to hear your comments on this one because am I completely wrong? Am I completely, you know, crazy? Am I off my rocker here? Maybe it's possible, but, you know, we've talked about reception theory before, the theory that states that, you know, the closer aligned you are with the author or who the author intended the reader to be, the better you're going to understand this. And maybe I'm just really characteristically misaligned with this. But if not, then this is my take. And maybe I'm right. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's open to interpretation like everything in life. Anyways, thanks for watching and we'll see you around soon.